Our next speaker in the last for this afternoon session is Pavel Blair for, from I, IUPUI. Mm -hmm. And he's going to talk about ensembles of random matrices with complex potential, phase diagrams, and topological expansion. Okay, thank you. Do you hear me? Okay, first, I would like to thank organizers Marco, Alberto, and Michael for inviting me to this uh, conference. It's very exciting and uh, to be uh, to celebrate uh, John Harnett. And because uh, we are friends with John for more than 25 years. And he was very active and uh, very, I would say, influential part participants of our first uh, meetings on random matrices. It was Mount Holyoke meeting in uh, 1996. And then a uh, big program at MSRI. And I remember very well his fantastic talks about this uh, uh, integrable relations in uh, for mat random matrices. And uh, for me, it was extremely interesting and extremely important. Right, then uh, this was continued. Right. So in uh, 2008, 2009, uh, uh, John kindly invited me to, to join him uh, in the organizing committee of one year program on probabilistic methods in mathematical physics at CRM. And this was uh, spent quite a lot of time there uh, at CRM giving some lectures. And also then uh, John published my lectures in the volume uh, he organized. And also I was working with my uh, uh, graduate student Carl Lifty at that time on random matrices and applications to six vertex model and, uh, and we wrote a book which is published in a CRM um, a lecture series. Okay, so, and uh, for me, obviously, I mean, uh, interaction with John was very enjoyable and very, interesting and very useful. So the, and I'm very, really very, very glad to be here. Okay, so I will talk about, uh, uh, right, uh, about random matrices of complex potentials and topological expansions, right? And this is my ongoing project with several people listed here. Uh, Ahmad Barhumi, Mark Cabertola, Alfredo Diania, Uzbek Gahlu, Ken Matlaf, and Alex Tobis, and Maxim Yatsalev. So different parts uh, of this work were done with, uh, with these people. Right, and so let me begin with a brief review of the topological expansion in the uh, in unitary ensembles of random matrices. It's very classical and uh, uh, very interesting topic. So let us begin with a real polynomial, V of X, uh, sum uh, Tj, Fj, right? And degree of the polynomial is even and the leading coefficient is positive. Then corresponding unitary ensemble of random matrices is the probability distribution uh, with weight function, uh, like in statistical mechanics, E minus energy, which is in this case minus n times trace v of m, v is this polynomial, m is our matrix, and emission matrix, right? And then dm, and then we have to normalize by partition function zero in statistical physics, right? And this gives us probability measure on the space of emission matrices. And what we are interested in, uh, the main question is uh, segment dynamic limit, when uh, n goes to infinity, what can we say? about asymptotics of Z and about uh, correlation functions uh, and right and uh, phase transitions, uh, phase diagrams uh, and parameters and so on. Right, so now uh, let me, uh, as an example, consider quartic polynomial, right? Uh, X squared over two plus U X to the fourth and U is uh, coefficient uh, at the fourth power T4 and uh, it is positive. Right, the uh, 
partition function of the quartic ensemble is just this integral over the space of matrices, uh, right, of this weight function. <coughs> now, when u equals zero, then we have uh, just x squared over two, it's quadratic, uh, it's a Gaussian unitary ensemble, and then partition function is uh, very easy to calculate, and it's given by this formula. Uh, uh, we will, let's consider a normalized partition function. It is the quotient of zero, uh, n of u divided by zero of zero, right? And then uh, to get uh, uh, topological expansion, uh, let's make the change of variables very natural, m prime equal m times square root of n, right? Then denoting m prime back uh, by m, we obtain that uh, the normalized partition function is the same integral, but uh, n now in denominator, yeah, right. Okay, so now uh, uh, we can view it as the following. Uh, so on the top, we have integral with this extra term in the weight, uh, quartic term. On the bottom, we just have uh, Gaussian ensemble. And so it's mathematical expectation of this uh, quartic term, explain the explain of quartic term, right. And so now, uh, uh, what we do to, to get the topological expansion, uh, we expand this, uh, right, this ex exponent in the uh, uh, mathematical expectation into Taylor series. And we calculate term by term uh, the mathematical expectations. So, uh, right, so in the Gaussian ensemble, the entries are, uh, independent and the correlation functions, uh, it is just uh, Gaussian, Gaussian correlation function. So it's two point correlation function is very, very, very simple. So the, it reflects that the matrix is Hermitian, right? And so it's written here. So now let us evaluate the first term here, the, the terms here, I mean, consecutive terms uh, in this sum. And uh, so EP is just mathematical expectation with respect to Gaussian ensemble of trace of m to the fourth to power p. Right, and so let us start with E1. Then there's this mathematical expectation. Now we can use the uh, weak theorem, which tells us that to calculate the fourth moment, we, can, uh, we have to consider partitions of the four points into pairs. Right, and in this way, we'll get the explicit formula, which is called weak, weak theory. And because we know, uh, uh, right, this uh, correlators, uh, P of correlators, it's immediately we'll get uh, th these formulas. And now we have summation over I, J, K, L, and all the terms are, right, so everything is partitioned uh, into two types of term related to IK, KL, and this product, and sums over uh, just uh, IK and KL give us terms in Q, but this term give us N. And so in the end of the day, we'll get that E1, this mathematical expectation is 2NQ plus N. Right. And so uh, these terms can be uh, represented by the uh, Feynman diagrams with one vertex. The first and third diagrams are planar of the genus uh, G equal zero, the diagram, and the second one is toroidal uh, of genus G equal one. Here, uh, right, they are very simple. So this is, uh, this diagram, uh, Feynman diagram, uh, can be plotted on the, on the sphere, on the, uh, on the plane, but this one is plotted on the torus. And so, so what we have that E1, as, as I said, so it is 2NQ plus N, and the N cubed terms correspond to two, two Feynman, Feynman diagrams or graphs on the plane or sphere. And the power three is the number of faces uh, in this graph, this power. The N term corresponds to the Feynman diagram on the torus, and the number of faces of this graph on the torus is one. Mm -hmm. And so we get that E1 can be written as sum over uh, pi's uh, graphs and to power f of pi with uh, f of pi just the number of faces. So this is for E1. 
uh, this can be extended to E2, E3, and so on. What about E2? When we consider E2, it is trace uh, m to the fourth of uh, square, and then mathematical expectation. If we multiply out completely, this trace will get these uh, eight terms. Right. And now again, we use a uh, weak theory, uh, and this gives us a sum of all partitions of uh, partitions pi of uh, this set of points, of these uh, eight points, into pairs. Right. And so now, uh, when we consider partitions, we'll have uh, two types of partitions. One type is the disconnected graph. And second uh, part is connected graphs, right? And so uh, disconnected graph just gives us uh, E1 square, where E1 was the first term. And the second part is, connect, is, is called connected part of Feynman diagrams, right? And so uh, these are examples uh, of uh, regular connected Feynman diagrams of degree four with two vertices. It is what corresponds to E2, to E2, right? And these are from E to C because we consider uh, connected graphs. So this, uh, the first graph is uh, uh, reproduced on the plane, on the sphere. And so it is genus zero surface. And this graph is reproduced on the torus. Uh, this corresponds to the uh, genus one, right? And so what we have that uh, uh, the connected part of E2 is sum uh, over all uh, Feynman five, five diagrams n to power f of pi, where f of pi is the number of faces of this diagram. Right. And this can be, this can be easily extended to any p. And what we have that the connected part of EP is represented by sum over all uh, graphs n to power f of f of pi, where pi uh, are uh, connected diagrams with p vertices. Okay. So now uh, we are interested uh, in the asymptotics of partition function, uh, and it is very convenient to introduce uh, normalized free energy as a logarithm of this uh, normalized partition function divided by the number of degrees of freedom. In our case, we have n square elements. And so we have to divide by n square. Right. And now uh, we can apply the second uh, weak theorem, and it tells us that the free energy, so when we take logarithm, we had some expression for zn of u divided by zn of zero, then we take logarithm, it should be more complicated, but in fact, it's simpler. And second quick theorem tells us that fn of u is similar sum as for z, uh, uh, zn of u, but uh, only connected uh, diagrams uh, uh, survive, right? And so uh, what, we, what we get, that uh, uh, free energy is uh, this uh, sum for p equals zero to infinity, p is the number of vertices, right? And then we have uh, some uh, minus u to power p, right? It comes from here. Then well, well, p, p factorial, so already from the exponent, but then we have this uh, sum over all uh, Feynman diagrams n to power f of pi minus p, where f of pi, remember, it is the number of faces. Right now, we can apply the Euler formula. And this gives us, uh, right, uh, that f of b, what's written here, is, my, is just nothing else but 2 minus 2g, where g is the genus of the surface. And uh, we, we get this uh, very nice uh, formula for, uh, for the free energy in terms of uh, sum of all Feynman diagrams are connected, right? And so, uh, and so this is the starting formula for the topological expansion, how to get it, 
Now uh, we interchange the order of summation here, right? And so first we uh, make summation over partitions and then over P, right? And so uh, what we get is uh, the second term is just number of uh, connected regular Feynman diagrams of uh, degree four with P vertices on a closed oriented Riemannian surface of general G. So this is this guy, this guy, right. And uh, right, and this is called uh, topological expansion because it is uh, expansion of uh, uh, Riemannian surfaces of uh, general zero, one and so on. So why it's so interesting because uh, if we look at the coefficients of one over n square expansion, these are generating function for the numbers a, g of p, which is the number of connected regular Feynman diagrams of uh, degree four with p vertices, right? But if p is, is large, that Feynman uh, the diagram of degree four can be viewed as an approximation of a metric on the uh, Riemannian surface. And in the limit, when P goes to infinity, this uh, gives some integral of a matrix. And so it is, uh, gives connection to quantum gravity. That's why, uh, right, this topological expansion uh, is, uh, right, uh, is, very, is very interesting and important. So these coefficients of topological expansion are generating function for the number of connected regular Feynman diagrams. Uh, right, and so uh, the one of n square expansion of the free energy is uh, called topological expansion. So far, the, my calculations were uh, uh, formal when I interchanged the order of summation. And so mathematically, the questions uh, are, to prove this rigorously, this uh, existence of uh, topological expansion, and, and also to calculate these coefficients and uh, uh, and the numbers uh, a a uh, g of p, which are uh, the number of connected uh, graphs of degree four with p vertices on the uh, closed oriented uh, surface of general g. So now uh, there are many, many works on topological expansion and uh, both in physics and mathematics. Here I listed some of them, right? And uh, it, it goes back to classical works of Hethoft, Brizan, et Sikson, Prezi Zuber, Brizan, et Sikson, Zuber, and so on, right? And mathematical uh, literature is also now rather big. Right, and uh, right, and uh, some contributions are uh, listed here. Okay. So now uh, the Riemann Hilbert approach to an evaluation of uh, topological expansion gives uh, uh, two things. It, first, it, uh, it gives rigorous proofs of the topological expansions, and also it gives some. Uh, efficient ways to calculate uh, to, to calculate the coefficients of topological expansion. So to do this, uh, we uh, uh, say for the quartic model, which I will uh, discuss mostly, we consider the partition function uh, of the ensemble of eigenvalues, right? And the free energy can be expressed as uh, a reduced, a logarithm of reduced growth. Uh, reduced quotient of partition functions of the ensemble of eigenvalues. This is, uh, 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 this is usual, uh, usual formula in this theory of random matrices. Right. Uh, so and important, uh, the first step in the uh, Riemann-Hilbert approach is to reduce, uh, to express uh, partition function of eigenvalues in terms of uh, uh, orthogonal polynomials, right? So now uh, we can see the orthogonal polynomials with 
this uh, weight. So it is um, monic uh, octagonal polynomials, and the weight is e minus n just uh, v, of v of x. In our case, it is uh, this written, what's written here, vortex polynomial. Right. And uh, this polynomial satisfies the free term recurrence relation uh, with, uh, right, which is written here. Again, it's uh, very well known. And Rn is the quotient of normalizing uh, constants. And the recurrence coefficients uh, also satisfy uh, what is called the string equation, right? Uh, and it is a nonlinear equation uh, for the, the recurrence coefficients. It's written here. So now, uh, uh, now what we are interested in in the asymptotics of the partition function. Partition function. Uh, is a product of normalizing constant, but this formula is not very convenient because we are interested in large uh, n limit of Zn and uh, asymptotic expansion with respect to n capital. But here we have a product, and this product uh, involves a uh, small n, uh, small n equals zero, one, two, and so on. And we don't have uh, uh, asymptotic expansions for these coefficients. And so we have to use something, something different. And something different is the following. So first we uh, prove the uniform topological expansion of the recurrence coefficients. And recurrence coefficients depends of course on the parameter u and on parameter n, but for, for me it would be more convenient to consider parameter uh, uh, right eta, uh, as n small over n capital, n small is the uh, degree of the polynomial and n capital is parameter in the weight. Right, and the first step is to derive asymptote, uh, topology, I would say topological expansion for the recurrence coefficients. Right, and uh, with uh, this Riemann Hilbert approach, we can prove uh, the existence of this expansion. And also we can prove that the coefficients in this one of n square expansion are analytic functions of eta and u. And we are mostly interested in, uh, in this case, uh, at the moment that u equals zero and at eta equals zero. Right, it will be uh, clear very soon uh, why. Right, and so the claim is that these coefficients are analytic functions of eta and u. Right at, at, at this point. So now we can calculate the co these coefficients very efficiently uh, if we use the uh, string equations. Namely, we take asymptotic expansion of uh, these uh, coefficients and we substitute and, uh, and uh, consider different powers of one over n square. And this gives us a, a, a right. Uh, some rec recursion equations which we can, can use uh, to calculate the coefficients. So, uh, for instance, the uh, leading coefficients I zero. This is coefficient uh, here, right? So it is just the limit. Uh, I zero is just the limit of I n. Right. Uh, is solution of this Faraday uh, equation? Right, and so uh, we get immediately the solution I0. Now, if we consider high order coefficients, then if we consider the term one over n to power to g in the asymptotic expansion of the current coefficient, uh, then we'll get this uh, equation, which gives us, uh, which, can, which, which is nothing else but a recursive formula for g. A g is expressed in terms of previous coefficients and their derivatives of respect to parameter eta. Right, and this way we'll can find R1, R2, and so on. So now next step, where we go from, uh, from topological expansion of recurrence coefficient to topological expansion of, of free energy. Right, and the key point here is the following uh, deformation equation, which is one of these uh, 
features of the random matrix model, which is uh, related to integrable structure of this uh, ensemble of random matrices. Right. And so what we have is this uh, deformation equation, uh, which gives us derivative of partition function entirely in terms of the recurrence coefficients. And what's very important here that uh, here we have recurrence coefficients only for large uh, indices, n and minus one and plus one. And we already know asymptotic expansion of these coefficients. And so this gives us topological expansion first for fn prime and then for fn. This is the, uh, the idea, right? And so as a result, we, we give a, a rigorous proof, a complete proof of uh, existence of topological expansion for the free energy. And also we get very efficient way to calculate these uh, terms, which I, I remind you is related to generating function for counting uh, graphs on the uh, Riemannian surfaces of G. G. Right, and this relation is uh, given in the following way. So we have uh, uh, asymptotic expansion of in powers one of n square of free energy and coefficients are generating function for the number of uh, Feynman diagrams or just graphs, regular graphs with uh, p vertices uh, with uh, four valent of, of degree four, right. And so this is extremely uh, right, uh, simple and uh, very uh, useful formula to calculate this. Right. So uh, this was done by uh, BC, Sitsitson, and Zubair uh, long ago for 0, 1, and 2. These are a number of, uh, on the sphere, on the torus, and Riemann uh, surface of genus 2. These are explicit formulas. And so what we did, we just proved the, this, this formula rigorously, right? And in fact, we calculated also the next term and in principle, you can continue, but the formulas becomes uh, rather complicated. And uh, what we would like uh, to do is to find large P asymptotics of these numbers. Because when we go to quantum gravity, we need P, uh, right, uh, uh, is taken to infinity because uh, P is the parameter of approximation of the metric, right? And so uh, this asymptotics uh, is, can be calculated, we calculate this and it's given by uh, the, the following formula. So it's some constant which depends on G, on uh, the genus. Right, and as p goes to infinity, this is the number of vertices. And we have this uh, uh, right uh, explicit asymptotics. Uh, you can calculate. We can calculate also subleading terms, but mostly we're interested in the leading term. Right, and let's now look at constant. It depends on the genus, and it can be calculated as follows. So it is uh, expressed in terms of uh, some different constant uh, c which we call uh, C script uh, to G. And the constant C uh, to G can be found recursively by this formula, right? Uh, it is quadratic, quadratic recursion. C to G in, in terms of uh, previous uh, Cs. And if we look at this formula, we can notice that the constants uh, CG or rather C2G uh, already are known. They appears in the Boutou uh, truncate or tree truncate solutions of the Penlevy-1 equations. Namely, if we consider the Penlevy-1 equation, which is written here, and uh, make a scaling of, a uh, very simple scaling of the solution, then, Except it goes to infinity, we have uh, this. In fact, it's asymptotic expansion in powers of x. Right. And uh, if you look at the recurrence equations for yg, you can notice that they are exactly the same as the recurrence equations for c to g. And 
uh, instead of C to J, I put here CJ, I'm sorry. Right, and so uh, somehow miraculously, the, uh, this uh, recurrence coefficients, uh, right, uh, this uh, coefficient uh, C to G are related to pin level one. And so, uh, and to, to understand this better, uh, we consider the, right, uh, we consider the following thing. So uh, I remind you that we, can, uh, we have from the very beginning, uh, we have Taylor series, FG of U is Taylor series with coefficients AG of P, uh, normalized by four to power P and P factorial. Right, and so if I'm interested in large P, then what should we do? We have to consider this function on the complex plane and find the closest uh, uh, extend this to, to, to analytic function. It's an function in the neighborhood of zero, but to, to extend it to the complex plane and find the closest singular point and uh, to calculate the behavior at the, uh, uh, at the singular points. Right, and uh, now this is the motivation we uh, that to consider uh, to, to, to consider uh, ensemble uh, ensemble of random matrices for complex values of u. Right, uh, on the for u on the whole complex plane. But now the integral is well defined when real part of u is greater than zero, but it diverges when real part of u is less than zero. And there are different ways to, then we need to regularize this integral, right? And there are different ways to do it. One of them is uh, rotate the pointer to keep the integral convergence. And this was done by Marco Bertola, uh, right, in, in his works uh, with uh, uh, Sasha Torbis and others. Right, but uh, another way is to make a change of variables. Uh, from z we go to zeta, and from uh, and uh, we introduce new parameter sigma instead of u. Right, and then uh, we consider this quartic model with after this change of variables. Uh, and the, the advantage here now that uh, the coefficients at z to the fourth is one now. And so the, uh, the integral is convergence everywhere and it gives us analytic function of sigma. Then if you, if you would like to go to back to you, you just use this, uh, uh, this covering, uh, right, uh, of your plane, right? And you, you can get uh, uh, depiction uh, on the U plane, right? And uh, uh, the partition functions are also very uh, uh, easily connected. And so uh, we're interested in this partition function of this uh, random matrix model of this polynomial. So now uh, this idea goes back to physicist uh, Francois David. And uh, uh, right. And uh, what we are doing, we are following uh, his intuition and his uh, non rigorous calculations, uh, first of all, to make everything uh, rigorous and then uh, to calculate uh, various things. Right, and uh, in what follows, I will present uh, my uh, results with uh, Ken McLaughlin, Rosberg uh, Garth. Uh, okay, uh, so, let me begin with the phase diagram. So now we are on the sigma plane. This is the uh, phase space of our model. Now uh, see it is a sigma plane, uh, complex sigma plane. And this is the phase diagram, which was numerically uh, calculated by Francois David, right? And uh, we have these three regions. I would say pure, pure phases, one cut region, region uh, two cut region, and three cut region, regions. Right. So now these are uh, the red dots are 
critical points. And uh, I will explain in what sense, but uh, this critical point, which is sigma equal negative two, corresponds to double scaling limit of Penlever two. And this one corresponds to uh, critical point of Penlever one. So now, if we go back to your variables, then uh, this point will be the closest to the origin. And it is described in terms of Penlevy one, the double, uh, the singularity of free energy at this point. And this uh, explains why in the asymptotics of uh, Taylor coefficients, we have uh, Penlevy functions, right? Uh, so the explanation is that because double scaling limit, uh, right, at this point is described in terms of uh, Penlevy one. So now, uh, to, to, uh, to, to apply the, uh, the classical Riemann-Hilbert approach works on the real polynomials. And so basically it real, uh, works on the real line uh, in the sigma plane. And so we have to extend it, try to extend analysis of octagonal polynomials to complex ways. And uh, right, and this is, and this and here we use uh, very recent uh, works all right on the equilibrium measures on the complex plane uh, which are called max mean equilibrium measures right and uh, we use here uh, concretely the work of uh, Arno Kairos and Guillermo Silva and let me just briefly describe uh, the result so we consider the quantum gamma on the complex plane. It is basically the quantum of, of integration for orthogonal polynomials. Now it can be uh, not only a real line, but uh, a quantum on the complex plane, right? And uh, we consider some class of quantums. It's uh, called, uh, they're called uh, admissible, right? And it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity uh, on the real line. And uh, it is a finite union of analytic arms. So this is the class of contours. And now we consider the space of probability measures on this contour. And we introduce the energy functional. It is the uh, uh, basic uh, fundamental step in the riemann hilbert approach and also in the physical uh, steepest descent method, right? And uh, the energy is given by uh, PFS energy uh, with uh, log it's Coulomb energy. And then we have external source or ex external field V. And here we take a real part of V and we integrate with respect to new. This is the uh, appropriate energy functional. And by uh, uh, very general results of the potential theory, there exists a uh, minimizer. Well, this measure, which are called new gamma of this functional. So that if I consider a minimum of all probability measures of this functional, then it is uh, attained in this minimize. This minimizer exists and unique. This is a very general result. But now we have uh, uh, this minimizer can uh, can be uh, described in terms of Euler Lagrange variational condition, and this is very useful. So the support of uh, the minimizers is some uh, compact set. In fact, it is a set of intervals, a union of intervals, and it is described by this uniquely determined by Euler uh, Lagrange variational conditions. And on the support of this. Uh, this measure, we have this Lagrange multiplier, L, right? And this is a variational condition, right? But outside of the support, uh, we have inequality. It is uh, uh, very similar to, uh, to the Riemann-Hilbert problem, to the Riemann-Hilbert uh, Riemann situation with on the real line. Right, uh, so what has changed here, we take real part and uh, the, the contour can, can be contoured in the complex plane. 
right? And uh, U is just logarithmic potential. So these are uh, Euler Lagrange variational conditions, right? And then to get the uh, equilibrium measure, we have to maximize the, the energy of the equilibrium measure over the set of admissible contours. And uh, what Kyle Larson and Silva proved that the maximizing port contour exists. Uh, second, the equilibrium measure is supported by a set J, which is a finite union of analytic arcs, which are called cuts, uh, because I have cuts of the resolvent to uh, right. Uh, and so these are intervals from AK to BK. So we assume that on gamma zero, we have some parameterization from minus infinity to infinity. And so this is from AK to BK. And so the uh, support is just finite union of intervals on gamma, or on gamma zero in this case. And fundamental fact that this uh, ox are critical trajectories of some quadratic differential. Uh, quadratic differential minus R of Z dz square, where R of Z is a polynomial. This is uh, this, uh, uh, right, I will uh, uh, return to this to critical trajectories just on the next slide, uh, explaining this, right. And, and second thing is that uh, this support of the equilibrium measure is unique. The sum, uh, the contour itself, gamma zero, is not unique because we can deform it outside of the uh, support of the equilibrium measure, but the set J is unique. So uh, the fact that these are uh, arcs are critical trajectories of the quadratic differential means that at the end points, uh, R is equal to zero, so the endpoints are zeros of the function R. And inside of the support, minus R, this square is strictly positive. Right. And, uh, right, and uh, the, the uh, very essential part uh, of the uh, uh, theorem of Kylars and Silva is some, I would say, explicit formula for the polynomial R of Z. It is, yeah, right. And so it is uh, the following that R of Z is equal minus uh, omega of Z, where omega of Z is the resolvent of this uh, equilibrium measure, plus V prime of Z over two square. And it is uh, extremely powerful and important uh, equation. It, it, it doesn't give explicit uh, formula for R, but uh, because, uh, right, because omega itself is uh, represented uh, right, as an unknown, an unknown integral, but still it is extremely powerful uh, formula. Right, now the equilibrium measure uh, nu zero is absolutely continuous with respect to arc length and its density is given in terms of square root of R, limiting value uh, from plus side in this case. And uh, plus side means uh, uh, if we move from uh, minus infinity to infinity, it is on the left-hand side. So now, uh, as in the theory of, uh, uh, equilibrium measures on the real line, we, we uh, distinguish between regular and uh, singular uh, equilibrium measures. And regular means that uh, all these arcs are disjoint and the endpoints are simple zeros. And outside of the support, we have strict inequalities uh, in the Euler-Lagrange condition. Here it is great or equal, but uh, if it's regular, then it should be you know, strict inequalities. If it is not, then uh, it's called singular. So now let us consider this uh, function R of Z 
for the quartic case, uh, uh, right, V of zeta sigma is quartic polynomial, right? And we'll get R of Z is minus resolving plus derivative of this, which is Z cube plus sigma of Z divided by two square. Now, this is, uh, this gives a lot of information about R of Z. In many, many cases, it's uh, right, completely determines R of Z, but not, not always. Right, and the, 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 uh, the, the key point is that the resolvent decays at infinity is one over Z. And so when we consider behavior at infinity, here we have uh, explicit asymptotics, polynomial asymptotics uh, as Z goes to infinity. And uh, this gives us, uh, right, but um, this gives us R of Z. But uh, this gives us leading term of R of Z, I would say. Right. So now, uh, in the case of quartic polynomial, we have additional information uh, about R of Z because uh, V of Z is even polynomial. And so this implies that uh, the equilibrium measure is even and the resolvent is odd and the polynomial R is even. Right. And so, now, right, what we have, of course, immediately that R of Z is a polynomial of the sixth degree. If we can see the polynomial of infinity. Right, and so uh, there can be uh, uh, three cases, one cut case, two cut case, and uh, three cut case. Uh, it depends on the number of intervals, but not more than, uh, than three, right? So if it is one cut case, then R of Z has the following uh, structure. We have a simple zeros at the end of the interval. And in this case, because of the symmetry, the interval, uh, the support of the measure is from uh, the endpoints are minus, minus B1 and plus B1. Right, and Z0, uh, minus Z0 and plus Z0 are double zeros of R of Z. Right, and then just not uh, end points. So now, uh, if we uh, equate our formula for R of Z with uh, the, this expression, so the linear terms are Z to the fourth, Z to the six plus two sigma, Z to the fourth, then quadratic term, and then constant term, uh, M2 is the, the second moment of uh, equilibrium measure. We don't know this, but still uh, we get uh, two equations for B1 and for Z0, so these coefficients, and we can solve them. And this gives us the endpoints and double zeros of uh, equilibrium measure. So this is an example, numerical example for sigma equal one plus i. This is a one cut equilibrium measure. So the support of equilibrium measure from minus B1 to B1, it's just along to this curve. And we have uh, two double zeros of the function R, Z0 and minus Z. Right, okay, so in the, uh, when we have two cut uh, case, then we have uh, two intervals. R1, B1, and minus B1, R1, right? And then the uh, double zero is just a zero because of the symmetry. And in this case, we get uh, equations on the endpoints, and right, we, we get just two equations, uh, simple, simple, simple uh, system of two equations. We can solve it for A2 square and B2 square. Uh, okay, right. And this is numerical example of two two cut case. This is for sigma equal minus three plus i. So we have uh, two intervals of the support, two cuts minus b two minus a one, a two b two, right, and double zero at zero. Okay, right. And so uh, in this shaded. Uh, regions, 
we have this Euler Lagrangian equality is strict. This is extremely important uh, for the equilibrium measure. Okay. Finally, in the free card regime, uh, the equilibrium measure uh, con uh, consists, uh, the support of the equilibrium measure consists of the free intervals. And uh, we have algebraic endpoint equations that only two equations and the, then in addition, we have two real equations uh, which are transcendental. They are given in terms of integrals and th they follow from the euler lagrange equations uh, because right, uh, the, the mesh is basically uh, positive, right? And so, and so we have these uh, two, uh, two additional equations, but they're not algebraic. And this has a very important uh, implications on the solutions uh, for endpoints. Right, so this example for the uh, support of the equilibrium measure in the free cut case, and uh, for as an example, sigma equal minus three plus two i, right? So these are uh, two symmetric intervals, and one is just around the zero, minus a three three. And uh, now we have the following description of analyticity of the equilibrium measure in one cut uh, and two cut regimes or regions, the equilibrium measure depends analytically on the parameter sigma. Basically, it means the end points depend analytically. And it is, can be understood very easily because uh, say in two cut case, we have uh, explicit uh, relation. We have uh, basically algebraic system with very simple solution. And this gives us analy analytic formulas. And similarly in one cut case. But in the three cut case, uh, we have to these two real equations. And as a result, we have the following uh, statement that the equilibrium measure depends analytically on the real part of sigma and the imaginary part of sigma, but not on sigma. Uh, so that the Cauchy-Riemann equations fail. Uh, they fail for the, for the end point, basically. Right, and from the point of view of uh, statistical physics, uh, this uh, uh, the free cut region is uh, is singular. It is uh, it's not. Uh, it consists of critical points because, by definition, uh, in the pure phases we have analytic uh, dependence, say, of free energy on C. But here we don't have. And so in, th in this sense, and it was already mentioned, uh, noticed by Francois David, uh, he said that something like that the measure does not exist in some sense. So now uh, returning to phase diagram and phase transitions, uh, I can formulate, uh, present the following results. Uh, some time ago, uh, Bertrand and now we proved that the critical point, at the critical point, sigma, sigma equal negative two, uh, the free energy exhibits a free order phase transition on the real line. This means that uh, the free energy and the first two derivatives are continuous, but the third derivative is a jump uh, at, at this point. The free energy is a function of sigma, real sigma. So now uh, with uh, uh, Alexander, it's proved that the critical point sigma equal negative two, the double scalar limit is described in terms of uh, ten level two uh, functions. This uh, uh, right, this uh, classical solution of uh, ten level two, and Moise Dietz and Arno Carlos they proved that uh, the critical point uh, twelve i is in fact at the critical point the double scale limit is p one. It's described in terms of uh, in terms of P1. So now, uh, in my uh, remaining time, I want to, to uh, present some uh, explicit expressions for the critical curves. So let me, yeah. So we describe uh, uh, 
behavior, critical behavior, double scale claim behavior at this point, at this point. But now I would like to describe uh, this critical cure. Uh, so one description is sort of transcendental. Uh, we have to, uh, that corresponds to the case when, say, uh, in one cut regime goes to free cut regime. That means that this uh, uh, these double zeros they come to the they either both of a cut or uh, right or the the cut is divided in two parts uh, split of a cut right. But these are transcendental, uh, very, very you know, unexplicit description. What we have is very uh, nice and very explicit description in terms of quadratic differentials. And this is what I want to describe now. So to do this, let us uh, just, uh, let us make substitution sigma equal minus three for beta plus four over beta. And let us consider the uh, pre-images of critical curves on the better place, on the better, better plane. And then the claim is that uh, these critical uh, curves are mapped on the critical trajectories of this uh, uh, quadratic differential. So this quadratic differential has uh, four zeros. Okay, some of them are uh, multiple zeros and uh, this pole at infinity, right? But this gives, uh, because the, the theory of quadratic differentials uh, is very well developed, this gives, I mean, the existence of the critical curves and many properties of them. Now, let me summarize uh, our main results. So uh, the critical curves are determined uh, the, by quadratic differentials. Uh, I described only from one to three, but there is even a simple description of from two to three critical uh, curves. Right. Now, uh, the uh, associated orthogonal polynomials admits one of n square expansion in one cut region, and free energy also admits one topological one of n square expansion in the following, uh, in the one cut region. Now, uh, this is still an open question is what uh, what can we say about topological expansions in two cut and three cut regions? And uh, in three cut regions, uh, something weird happens. I mean that uh, orthogonal polynomials do not exist on some lattice of points. And uh, in this sense, we cannot expect this uh, Usual formulation of the topological one of expansion. I believe it, it something can can be done, and but uh, it is similar to this uh, uh, KM theory when we have resonances. Right. So now uh, the cubic case uh, is also very interesting uh, uh, in terms of topological expansion because it gives uh, asymptotics of Feynman graphs of degree three on Riemannian surfaces or uh, equivalently uh, number of tri triangulations. In this case, we have uh, we need regularization from the very beginning because for any u, even u positive, the integral is divergent, but it can be done. Right, the phase diagram of this uh, is described in David and uh, we rigorously investigated it uh, together with Bakhumi, uh, Diani, and Yats. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Pavel. Uh, let me ask if there are questions here in the audience or at home. Alberto, second. And you hear me? Yes, yes, Alberto. Very well. Going back to the very beginning, and I don't know anything about these matrix models, but you use this Vic formula, which yes. gives you a way, in the simplest case, you have a bunch of independent mean zero Gaussian random variables. Uh, right, absolutely. And, and you take the product, x1, x2, xn, and there right. is a way of computing the expected value. This yes. is 
Now that, and, and I'd realized now you're doing perturbations of that and so on, but stick to the basic Gaussian case. If yeah. you have, again, a collection of independent, I'm sorry, not, not, not independent, I should say correlated, but jointly Gaussian random yeah. variables with means that don't need to be zero. There are formulas in terms of sum, summing over contributions from graphs if you have, instead of x1, you put a Hermit polynomial of degree n1 of x1 times another Hermit polynomial of degree n2 of x2, ta ta ta, eh? the product of these guys. Yes. Do they play any role here? I mean, what, one can write formulas in the Gaussian case. And now okay. yes. you, you are counting, I presume, graphs that have different degrees. Now the degrees are going to be n1, n2, n3 at each one of these vertices. And right. presumably there are perturbations of that too. Right. Uh, okay, the, the, the answer is that probably it describes some different combinatorial uh, setting, but, uh, right. but I'm not sure what kind of combinatorial problem we will get. So here we're counting uh, the number of graphs. Uh, if it is a Hermit polynomials, then I don't know. I mean, in some other language, instead of Hermit polynomials, these people call the things, I mean, I, I forget the notation. You have a field phi yeah. to the N and you put two dots on each side, whatever, the time order version of that or the big polynomial. I'll, yeah, so if you have some moments related to the uh, Hermit polynomials, mm -hmm. I understand this, but uh, I'm not sure uh, how you can, uh, uh, what kind of combinatorial problem you can solve on this. I'll, I'll, I'll try to connect with you by email. Okay. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? I, I actually have a question myself. So. You got this description of the uh, phase transition curves in terms of a quadratic differential, right? Right. Now, uh, right. So does so the question I have is: Is this a an act and happy a happy accident, or it should happen for right. other polynomials? Well, well, this is this, this is my hope. Mm -hmm. And so in for general, cubic, uh, for cubic, we know for cubic the same thing uh, for cubic ensemble. Uh, then it is uh, then it's even even simpler. Now, suppose that you have a polynomial potential where you have additional parameters, not just sigma. Yeah. So right. Two, right. So, is there is some? Is it possible to get some kind of uh, surf now the the phase transition is a surface. Yes, yes, exactly. For instance, if you can consider quartic plus cubic. Yeah. Okay. But then I don't know the answer. Okay. It is very very good question, but uh, well, we have we are planning to look at this to get together with you. By the way. Yeah, but, so I think that the reason, you, the underlying reason why you get the transition here, yes. the, the, the phase transition curves yes. by quadratic differential is because on those transition curves, the, uh, you know, the, the, you have effectively just one cut, even if those are the separating curves between genus uh, two and three yeah. cuts, right? Right, after, after this mapping. Yeah. Right. In general, I'm not so sure. Okay, so yeah. Uh, but what I want to say is that on on the beta plane we have these uh, critical trajectories, but some of them are what's called to fake. Fake. Okay. Yes. yes yeah. exactly. They do not co correspond to the real critical no. trajectories, <clears throat> uh, critical curves on the sigma plane. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Pavel. Of course. Any other questions? Doesn't look like so. We can thank the speaker. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Pablo. And this ends the afternoon session. We were.